We are still on the Joy News Channel. We're heading to the University of Professional Studies here in Accra for the annual leadership lecture. And it is on the topic, Tragic of the Common Leadership for the Common Good. And the registrar that I hope I can do well with all the names and everybody <laughs> that is he's done. But the uh, chair of the University Council, Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, my Lord uh, Bishops, all of you distinguished traditional leaders, members of Parliament, members of state, distinguished members of the academia, and members of staff of this great university. And all of you dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I greet all of you very warmly and I do commend this session and everything else that would follow. to God's own blessing and care. Before I start saying whatever you want me to say, <laughs> I've been invited to address, I'll just introduce some small correction to the topic so it makes sense and so that you're able to connect with me. The topic should read the tragedy of the commons, not the tragic commons the tragedy of the commons and leadership for common good. And so, my dear friends, with immense gratitude, sentiments of gratitude to the Vice Chancellor, Chairman of Council and, 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 and the Board of this University for this invitation extended to me to be here to share some thoughts with you about leadership and with great gain similar sentiments of gratitude to all of you for gathering here for having left everything that you could be doing on this beautiful Wednesday morning to come here to listen to a mind speaking you know mind speaking that's, that's how you call anybody who was born in a mining town you call him mind speaking and since I was born in Insuta Waso, near Takwa, I'm a mind speaking. So to gather to listen to a mind speaking is, is interesting. So, my dear friends, there is a literary genre, a way of using and writing language that presents hypothetical situation out of which we can draw some lessons of life. Such literary genres that present such hypothetical situations are sometimes referred to as parables, and the Bible does a lot of them. But it's not only the Bible that does parables or such hypothetical situations. You do have them also in civic life and also in the world of science. This morning I'd like to discuss one such parable, one such hypothetical presentation of a situation with you under the topic or the title, The Tragedy of the Commons, and seek to draw some lessons out of this parable or hypothetical situation and apply them to leadership and how they can also, from their lessons, help us appreciate and understand leadership that can serve the common good. And so, the Industrial Revolution which began in Britain in 1760 had spread into the rest of Europe and North America by the middle of the subsequent century between 1820 and 1840. The accompanying agrarian revolution had put an end to the feudal system of Europe at that time and was beginning to adjust to the industrial revolution, the euphoria of the discovery and application of technology and machines 
and the industrialization of several processes of uh, making new things. But there's one small remnant of the agrarian culture which remained, and that is the establishment and the presence of what we call the commons. The commons is whenever a piece of property is declared as open access area to a group of people who are normally landless, they didn't have any land, but who are given a piece of property that they can access so that they can take care of their own livelihood, fashion their social security, and continue to make their lives work. Commons are very popular, or were very popular in Europe at the beginning of the century, and continue to exist on several, in several forms of late. It was a case of a shared resource, which is co-owned, co-organized, and administered by its users and a stakeholder community of communities to well organize to manage the existence of the property for their well-being. It could be a term. It could be an activity, but it could also be a space or some resource which is managed, or sometimes the combination of all of these, which are managed and are meant to serve the common good of the community or the group. It involved the pooling together or the mutualization of the resources whereby individuals exchange with the totality in an ecosystem who will help satisfy the need of all. The commons then evolved from a pre-capitalist system of natural resource management to later on, under the industry, in the industrial revolution, become something a little bit more complex and complicated, adopting several forms as the industrial revolution and the upset of capitalism also required. So several welfare states began with some such commons. And as the time, as time went on, some of these commons trans transformed or metamorphosed into confraternities or solidarity groups with the single objective of ensuring the security and the mutual benefit of all of those who were members of the common. Then, somebody had the idea of looking at, but what happens when the regulated system fails? And this is what happened in 1833, when an economist by name William Foster Lloyd published a small leaflet in which he studied a case of a common where the regulation doesn't function. And then his conclusion was that when the regulation does not function in a common, it leads to the collapse of the system itself. The hypothetical case of a land that Lloyd was studying was the situation of cattle herders who shared a common parcel of land on which they were each entitled to breed their cattle. There was an agreement about how many cattle each member or each family could have. But if a herder put more than his allotted portion of cattle on the ground, because he wanted some more benefit, or because he claimed he had a right to do it, then chances are that the grazing field would not suffice for all of them. And if other members of the common would adopt the same system of introducing or increasing their own benefit and introducing or increasing their cows on the, on the, on the, on the property, 
then it will simply lead to overgrazing and then the collapse of the common. So this is what happened. And when the economist Lloyd came out with this story, he just wanted to prove a very simple fact. And the fact was how economic benefits and the abuse of rights could lead to the destruction of a noble institution. Economic benefit insistent on rights leading to the collapse of a system that supports the life structure of a whole group. These days, there is still one common that exists which is talked about a lot. It is the so-called Boston Common. In downtown Boston today, you have a 50-acre piece of land that still maintains the name Common, so-called Boston Common. But the origin of Boston Common was very similar. It was a land of an English settler who owned 50 acres of land and sold 44 acres to the governor. Who settled on this land? The Puritans. And then, later on, had a system where each family could bring 70 animals to breed on the land. And when again, as before in the case of Lloyd, people exceeded the numbers granted to them, there was overgrazing and there was a collapse of the system. And so, not an economist, this time an ecologist, who in the interest of pushing for the sustainability or sustainable development of the land, revisited the idea of the economist Lloyd and wrote about the title of our talk this morning, The Tragedy of the Commons. Garrett Harden wanted with this, with a small article, to simply say that the collapse of any piece of property which is meant to sustain and support the existence of a group of people uncontrolled and unregulated can lead to situations which will make everything fail for the group. And this article began to make the rounds. Garrett, when he wrote this article, wanted, as I said, to make a case for sustainable development and considered how inordinate exploitation of natural resources could lead to the depletion of what we have. And he went to the point of applying this even to human population and came out with a theory that the earth with its limited resources can just not handle just any growth of human population. For this, Garrett was later on attacked and even called an, an uh, eugenicist for wanting to promote a selective breeding of humankind. But that wasn't the central point of Garrett Harden. Garrett wanted to demonstrate that a piece of limited facility which is used without any controls and any law would at the end of the day not be able to serve the people and the communities that the property was destined to serve. So this was the story of the tragedy of the commons. And it's a tragedy because the pieces of property set out but when the uses of the property yielded to something that was within them and increased their own exploitation of the property, the resource failed all of them. And not only did the resource fail them, but those who increased their access to the property for gain ended up cheating on those who tried to be altruistic and not to increase their demands on the property. So, Garrett then says this, Therein 
is a tragedy. Each person is locked into a system that compels him to increase his animals without limit. In a world, however, that is limited. Ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. So when each dependent of the common insists on his rights and his right to increase his own benefits, the risk is that the, the common does not succeed or is not able to respond to the needs expected of it. And from this small experience of the tragedy of the commons, when people insist on their rights and increase the exploitation of a limited facility, then that facility fails all who depend on it. And there are a few lessons to draw from this tragedy of the commons. As we have observed already, Garrett lamented the collapse of the commons for ecological reasons. But it is possible already now to describe what the tragedy consisted in. And it is simply this. At the heart of the tragedy was greed. Simply greed. Greed prevented a common resource, a common endowment from fulfilling its purpose, namely from serving the common good or the common need of all who depended on the property. They all will eventually be depleted if everybody in greed extracted from the property more than the property can yield or they give. So the problem of under the, then there is a problem then of under investment. There are those who gain more from the property, but then who has to plant the other grass for the new year coming up? And who has to invest in the sustainability of the product? There arises of therefore the problem of under investment. Under investment comes up when those left behind cannot sustain the property and therefore cannot keep it sustainable. The tragedy of the commons then becomes a conflict for resources between individual interests and the common good. And a popular common dilemma is a social dilemma in which people's short term and sometimes selfish interests are at odds with the long-term interest and the vision of the common. So clearly then, my dear friends, the tragedy, the tragedy of the commons is an economics problem in which every individual has an incentive to consume a resource, but at the expense of every other individual and with no way to exclude anyone from consuming. The ensuing social and political problem is either that each individual is incentivized to act in a way that would ultimately be harmful to the common, or that a higher authority simply needs to step in, take control of the commons, and begin to administer it in the end, by way of helping the commons meet their needs. Accordingly, one thing that is clear for Garrick is the use of commons. One cannot rely on conscience because he says that people do not listen to their conscience in such situations as a means of policing their use of the commons. Because this favors selfish individuals over those who are more altruistic, and this is really the tragedy. And the reason for me 
to complement this term is this. It is true what Gary says. When there's a limited resource available to us, and a group of us depending on it, and some decided to exploit or extract more from the property, then chances are that the property cannot succeed in fulfilling the needs that it was designed, designed to fulfill. But when Garrett goes one step further and refers to this situation as a tragedy, then for me there is something else that he's saying that he does not explore. To call anything tragedy is to use a word that invites us to recognize the core and the reason for the problem. Tragedy is derived from a Greek word, tragodia, and tragodia in ancient Greece was the name of a theatrical performance. If any of this is not clear to you and you have read the book of Macbeth before, we're talking about that. It's a theatrical performance where a flaw in somebody's character constitutes his ruin, despite his noble intentions and the nobility of his position. That a flaw within somebody leads to the ruin of that person, despite his noble intentions, a noble character, a noble disposition, and everything. That is what the Greeks used to celebrate in theater and call the tragedy. So tragedy is when a noble person with very noble intentions but has within himself a flaw. And that flaw sometimes they call the hubris. Or normally is a thing of pride or arrogance. In this case, Gareth says selfishness would cause the ruin of a very noble enterprise and a noble project. So deciding to talk about the tragedy of commons is precisely that. Living in a country like ours, and several others living in a world like ours. Why should we talk about ecological crisis? Why should we talk about the disappearance of snow from Mount Kilimanjaro? Why should we talk about the fact that the river Pra is now reduced to a puddle and no fish grow and lives anymore in the river? And so why should we be talking about all the environmental damages? Noble projects, handled by noble people who fail to recognize their ruin, their flaw within them leads ultimately to the ruin of such noble projects. So that is what the tragedy of the commons is about. It's about a project about fulfilling the needs of all of us, if you want, ensuring our social security, keeping us close to our livelihood, and ensuring that we have what it takes to maintain and to sustain our lives. Just that we forget that this is managed by people who may have flaws. Flaws within them and yielding to those flaws, sometimes the nobility of the project doesn't work and it collapses and this is the tragedy of the commons. So this is what I wanted to discuss with you this morning. Talking about the tragedy of the commons and look at some of the lessons that come from it and from that sea. Whether this can provide some ingredients for restructuring our vision of leadership and see how we can best position them to serve our common needs. So, analogies exist to this piece of property called common commons managed for, by people who then yielding to selfish needs and personal individual interests lead that into a collapse, causing a lot of negative externalities for those who did not cause any such thing. This is UPS, right? So here you do business studies. So you understand externalities, when they are positive and when they are negative. In a situation of a tragedy of the commons, those who try to play fair suffer negative externalities. You bring to them damages that they didn't plan with and they didn't reckon with, but which they have to bear because others have to make gains. So that's what we're looking at. 
And in that sense, there are a lot of analogies like this in the world. I've mentioned some already. We're now dealing with climate crisis. Pretty soon we'll be gathered in Egypt, COP 27, to deal with the climate crisis again and see how we can listen to this. It began in 2015 in Paris, where I had the, the task of represent, representing the Vatican in the negotiation there for COP 25 by the accord. It's been, we've been doing this for every year till we're now heading for COP 27. And if you did follow that of last year in Glasgow, you saw the British moderator of the event on the last day shed tears before the camera because he could not succeed in attaining the deal that he wanted to. Countries which mine coal were not ready to give up their coal mines. India leading them and saying that it was time for them to develop their industries. And so on camera, he shed tears that he could not attain his objectives. But the climate crisis is still with us. And what we, should, what we want to do with it is it with us. Here, I suppose, because we're in the tropics, it doesn't make much sense to talk about temperature increase. Because we say we are in the tropics already. But there is indeed temperature increase. And if you go along the coast, you see all the coconut trees falling into the sea. Because the sea rise is on us. So we're suffering the impact of it. We're not like any of the Pacific Islands where the island is going on the water or the highest point of the island is only one meter above sea level. We do have a lot of land mass, but the coastline betrays the fact that there's still something happening. So that is the climate. In India, most of the year you don't see the top of Mount Everest because of smog, because of polluted skies. Same thing happens in China every now and then. And here, because of gold mine, gold mining in our rivers, our rivers are being reduced to a puddle. Go to the rivers that feed into the pra, and it's all puddles. And Cobra is not a flowing river anymore because of search for gold. You know, there's one thing that is being talked about. Because a month ago, I was in Sweden. And there, there is a group intending to take to the United Nations a document that they call the Ecocide, or Ecocide Law. They're trying to get the United Nations to support the promulgation of a law that would enable people to prosecute people who cause or who kill, as it were, the environment. If such a law would pass, Ghana could be prosecuted for killing a lot of natural resources. I will leave that law to the United Nations and what they will do with it. But the ecocide law is on and is being promoted and that is in the interest of people who think that they need to protect the environment for, from abusive treatment. But that's again the tragedy of the commons. When we talk about it sometimes we say that what kind of earth do we want to leave to our children and those who come after us? We receive the earth as a garden. That's how God created it. But we don't want to leave a desert for those who come after us. But that's a decision again that we need to take. So this is the sense of tragedy. To call anything tragedy means you say at the same time that there is a flaw within the human person which causes the ruin of whatever you're dealing with. So the tragic of the, of the commons is simply to draw attention to this. Commons were meant to ensure the security of people. But again, because of flaws within us, self-interest, personal interest gain and all of that, commons do not work. And analogies of those exist. They exist in the world, they exist in countries, and they exist in different several situations. So, all of this being the case, the title of this lecture is Leadership. So what to do? When Garrett wrote, wrote, wrote his book about the tragedy of the commons, 
they propose three solutions for dealing with it. Entrust the management of the commons in their more, in more capable hands. So provide new leadership for the commons. Another solution was privatize the commons. Have a more capable, powerful group take care of the commons to manage the commons. And the third one was encourage the group themselves to form some decent cooperatives that can take charge of the commons. This one we want to talk about the first option, providing leadership for the commons. And when we talk about providing leadership for the commons, then I necessarily need to think about what that leadership is. So it means, for example, we're talking about having human beings and they need to understand them when they lead and when they are led. Human beings when they govern and when they are governed. Human beings are the different side of the bar. Do they function differently? Or is it the case that at a certain point flaws leave their hearts and they do not operate or function anymore under these flaws that cause hybrid? That is what we want to talk about. And this probably should make several of you recognize that it is a recognition of this, that leadership is always to do something that is very challenging and tough task, that in the past every form of leadership or kinship was anointed. Anointing was a process of appropriating some or approximating somebody to the divine. Because, because the rule of people was considered to be a divine function. So whenever they constitute anybody to be king or ruler or whatever, in antiquity, they thought that the thing to do was to make him divine or godlike or whatever, and they did that by anointing. That was simply to impress upon the candidate being anointed that the task before him or her is a, is a tough, almost a divine-like task. That doesn't happen a lot these days, but that does not take away from us the challenge of needing to recognize what it is that we are addressing. So, two basic questions. What is the human person when he leads, and what is the human person when he is led? What is the human person when he governs, and the human person when he is governed? Does something change within them? Or is it just a nomenclature or title that is given and which doesn't mean a lot. What I'd like to suggest is that from my own uh, small office, a lot of which uh, the registrar talked about, we, we, we've battled with this for a while and we decided, we, we, we uh, formulated a series of principles with which we have met sea of mining companies and tried to share this with about leadership We've met CEO of oil and gas companies, Epson, Epson, uh, Exxon, uh, Exxon, Exxon Mobil, BP, um, Elf Total. CEO of uh, this company just to talk of discuss leadership, leadership with them, uh, let, as well as CEOs of, of uh, even confectionaries, sweet making uh, factories. And when they come in, in conversation, we just try to share with them certain basic principles. Basic principles because for us we think that they tend to understand, is first understand who and what the human person is. And so any exercise of leadership must depart and start from a clear and solid understanding of the reality you're dealing with. What is man or what is woman or what is the human person? On account of that, we say, first and foremost, the human person is a being with dignity. Dignity which is not conferred by anybody. Dignity that people are born with. And every human person has this dignity. And when you call somebody a person, it's because you want to affirm this dignity that everyone has. And dignity is not something that the government confers on an individual. And no world institution is in a position to confer dignity on any person. It's something that we're born with as persons. 
What the government does is to facilitate their development and the realization of what we have. What we born with, its realization and its growth and development is what? External structures like governance and all of that should help us attain. So this is dignity. And then dignity is also of a character. It's, a, it's, a, it's a something that one person does not have more dignity than another person. This is the sense that is conveyed when sometimes you talk about humanity as a human family. When you talk about a human family and suggest that all of us gathered our brothers and sisters, you making at the same time the affirmation of the, of, of the, of the common dignity of all people. For example, when you talk about people being brothers and sisters, here in Ghana we don't speak Greek. But if you were to follow any of these guys into whatever, the Greeks call a brother and a sister Adelphos or Adelphe. And what does that mean? We're from the same womb. And with that, what they said is that it's not possible that two people come from the same womb and one has more dignity than the other. It's impossible. So referring to people as brothers and sisters is to make that affirmation. There's no way that any one person has more dignity than the other. All men, all people, men and women have the same dignity. And this dignity is something that we cherish and we hold together. So besides having our dignity which makes us persons, we also live as relational beings in relationship with one another. If you want, we relate, if you are a believer, we relation with God whom we believe created us, then we relation to one another with whom we live in society, and then we in relation also with creation, the earth or nature, which supports our lives. So we are relational beings. And this brings up one of the crucial subject matter. Being relational beings who live in relationship the word that comes out of this is justice. What does justice mean? Before we refer to a court of law or anything, justice simply basically means the respect for the demands of the relationship in which we live. When we respect the demands of the relationship in which we live, that's our justice. When we disregard the demands of the relationship in which we live, that's our injustice. It's a very simple concept term, concept, but that's also something we struggle with. The demands of the relationship. Father and his children, there is a relationship. When the father respects the demands of having children, that's justice. When the children respect the demands of their, uh, having a father, that's their justice. Authority set over us. Everything, everything between us is based on relationship and every relationship has demands. And when we respect the demands of the relationship in which we live, that's our justice. When we disregard those demands, that's our injustice. So from dignity, which manifests itself in the relational, uh, uh, term, the relational links in which we live, in which our lives are expressed, comes the idea of justice. And justice is simply an, an invitation to us to respect the demands of the relationship in which we live. At elections, we elect a government. And so we create a government. There is relationship created. And that obliges us to respect the demands of this relationship. And those who are elected also become whatever, also establish a relationship. And it's also up to them to respect the demands of the relationship of the electorate. So everything, everything that encompasses our lives on earth are based on this relationship. And they are all governed by justice. Respecting the demands of the relationship in which we live. Now when justice is the procuring the, the, good, the good of uh, the dignity of each one of us, then the question that comes up is, when we try to promote the dignity of everybody, we are working for their common good. Their common good is ensuring that the dignity that they have is protected and helped to flourish. And the flourishing of the dignity of every person is the flourishing of his common being, is the flourishing of his common good. And this is a task of each one of us. It's not only a task for government, it's a task of each one of us. 
we need to work on making each one's dignity flourish. And to do that, there is the other principle that you call solidarity. Solidarity means you contribute, you make your contribution towards the well-being of the other person you live with. And this is not new. Aristotle, way back before Christ, formulated the principle that all members of a community or society have the responsibility of contributing to the well-being of each one in the society. And so, making a contribution towards the well-being of others in society is our sign of solidarity. We act in solidarity with them. And when in the process, somebody is weak and not able to make a contribution, then you help him to be able to make a contribution. And that is the principle of subsidiarity. You give him help. You, make him, you, you, you grant him subsidy, or subsidy not the financial, but you grant him help to enable him to be able to play a role. Everybody should be solidary, contributing to the well-being of another, each one of us, but when somebody doesn't have the means to do that, then that person needs to be helped to be able to make a contribution. And helping somebody to be able to play a role in society, that is subsidy. That's a subsidiarity, enabling the person to be able to make a contribution towards what we have. And when all of this, all, all of this is put together, subsidiarity becomes very crucial because it's also a way of affirming your respect for another person's dignity. Somebody way down there, because of poverty or whatever the situation is, runs the risk of being, being, being just disregarded as somebody worth nothing. But that's also somebody with dignity. And when you grant subsidiarity, when you grant help to the person to be able to make a contribution, you have manifested your own respect for the dignity of that person. And all of this happens so that all of us can have access to the good things of creation. And this is the principle that we call the universal destination of the goods of the earth. When the good Lord created all of us and he created and put us in the garden or created the world, it was that the idea was that all of us should support and nourish ourselves from the good things of creation. So the goods of the earth are not destined to, for some to the exclusion of others. There is a universal destination of the goods of the earth. All of us are destined to benefit from the good things of the earth. It's not for one to the exclusion of the other. So this is also the thing. So when we put all of this together, we have a principle that affirms the dignity of every person and affirms the fact that we live, however, in relationship with one another. And this is to promote the well-being of each one of us, our common good. And to promote the common good of each one of us, we all need to come together contribute. In solidarity, we contribute to the well-being of each one of us. And when somebody is weak or poor enough not to be able to make a contribution, then the thing is that we should enable, we should help that person, subsidiarity, to be able to make a contribution. And when we so succeed in making all of this happen, then we fashion access to the good things of the earth for each one of us. So we advance these principles and put this before any leader. For any leader, anybody who comes to exercise leadership, we say these are the things you need to understand about every human person. And you cannot exercise true leadership when you do not appreciate and understand what a human person is, his dignity, which does not come from you because you're a president or you're a head of state. It's a dignity that people are born with. Not even the United Nations grants dignity to people. Nobody does bestow dignity on people. They stuff we born with. What states and governments do is to promote the flourishing of the dignities that we have. And when that flourishing occurs, then we have an experience of our common good. And for that, all of us contribute and we make a contribution to this. And if there should be a weak one who is not able, then the thing is that we enable that one to be also able to make a contribution. So, dear friends, these principles are principles that we played before all leaders who come and hold conversation with us about the exercise of their leadership. 
And we tell them, please try to understand this about a human person. You cannot exercise true leadership when you do not understand the subject that you're dealing with. And if each one has a dignity that doesn't come from you that you need to promote, then you do everything in humility to promote the dignities of people. So we started our conversation with the tragedy of the commons. It was an economic model. And therefore, the solution of it is not simply understanding the human person, but also understanding economics. And here, I know I'm treading on dangerous grounds, because this is where the expert economy, economists and all of you live. But as you also know, without, doing, without having studied economy, you can still also read about it somehow. And sometimes when you read about it, you get some small ideas and stuff like that. So, from my reading about, about this, I describe two types of economics. Political economics and civil economics. Political economics was led by Adam Smith. And that's everything that has to do with the growth and everything. Everything is mercantilized. Okay? And Adam Smith gives the story that if a beggar comes to me and he begs for something and I give it to him, that beggar is not able in the evening to meet me in the pub for a beer. But if that, be that ex-beggar would come with a business proposal, then in the evening he's likely to be able to meet me in the pub uh, because we're talking about contractual partners. And so for Adam Smith, there's no, there's no, there's no room for morality and the thing about brotherhood and sympathy and all of those things. Uh, Everything every is con contractual models that can be transacted and all. So that has to do with political economics. And against this, we come and we say, but what does economics mean? Economics, or economia, two Greek words put together. The management of oikos. Oikos is house in Greek. So economics is essentially the management of the resources of a household to be able to satisfy every member in the household. That's all. When you manage the resources of a household and oikos, so that every member of the household benefits from the resources, you've done economics. And you've done it very well. Therefore, economics is not simply this, you know, the capitalist base that's not about pursuit for gain and gain and gain and gain, uh, as it were, absolutism, uh, you know, uh, shares and gain. Another phase of economics, which is referred to as a civil economics, invites us to make pursuit economics, that is, people or person based or person centered economics. Economics that is rooted on the well-being of the human person. And such, a, such economics does not treat a human person as a commodity to be, to, to be you know, to enter into transaction with, but as, some, as, a, as a being with dignity to be respected as such. So, once uh, our boss, the, soul, the Pope, made a statement with Barack Obama quoted before the Senate, and he said, when a poor man dies on the street from exposure, because now well clothed and in the night he dies because of cold, he doesn't make the headlines. But let the stock exchange fall one or two points headlines. So, where is the value? When a poor man dies on the street, it's no headlines. When the stock exchange falls one or two points, that's headlines. That's, what does that betray? So, so that's our sense of values at a certain point with some of these things. So that's why there's a difference between political economics type of thing of Adam Smith, which almost sometimes is sometimes also referred to as Robinson Crusoe economics. You know Robinson Crusoe. He was the only one on the island, so everything was about him. So as opposed to that economy, we talk about civil economics. Civil economics means consider the mutuality of individual people living together and make resources serve the well-being of all. So with all of this, I think I've exceeded my, 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 my time. But all of this is simply to say that the tragedy of the commons simply invites us to consider the fact that there is, there are forces sometimes within us which makes it difficult, which makes some very noble enterprise and stuff come to ruin, and that we need to deal with that. That's why it's so very important to 
to, to recognize that a whole lot of issues have serious anthropological character. You need to understand the human person a whole lot of issues. And when the human persons themselves are humble enough to recognize that this is what you know, exists within them, it makes a whole lot of these things a lot easier. But when there's a total and utter blindness to all of these factors within us, then we plunder from error into error. And we sink deeper and deeper and deeper into the distress and the ruin that we like to avoid. So all of us like to live in a good world, although presently we live in a world of a lot of greed. And so I am hoping that with this small conversation that I've had with you, you'll be able probably to derive some small lessons for yourselves and help us also recognize that members of the common, that's all of us. And the selfishness that can come from all of us. And the collapse of the common, that is sometimes done by all of us. But all of us also recognizing that the hubris is in all of us, are also invited to do what we can to deal with the hubris so that everything can glory for all of us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please, another round of applause for His Eminence. After a presentation as powerful as what we just heard, nothing else needs to be said. I think what we need to do is reflect before the Q&A session. So I invite the choir to give us one selection for our reflection, after which we'll have a question and answer period. Thank you.
to be taken five on this side. Well, the 